Okay, welcome everybody to the Launch Accelerator's 18th class to just give you a little background on what we do as a firm. Uh, we have uh, a podcast, This Week in Startups, uh, that we do for free and a bunch of educational resources like founder.university, angel.university. We engage tens of millions of people a year with that content, which then goes down to the next part of our funnel, which is uh, the Launch Accelerator. And the Launch Accelerator is just like any other uh, accelerator out there. Uh, we put in $100,000 and we work with the companies now fully remote, um, which we started in the last two classes, going to hybrid remote and then fully remote. And it's a, a four month program now. We have a couple of weeks of pre work and um, we then do four months with the companies uh, and spend another eight months with the company. So, really, a year long program doing eight check in calls. So, uh, these companies, we put 100K into in the Launch Accelerator. Then when they graduate, uh, which this class is graduating, and this happens to be one of the strongest classes we've ever had in terms of traction, uh, we will make a determination if we want to put more money into the company. We have something called thesyndicate.com, which is the largest angel syndicate in the world. And um, that syndicate is now doing one to two deals a week. So it's really picked up some pace. Uh, and the average check size there is 400K, 500K. So what you'll see us do is when these companies graduate, if they get a term sheet, we will uh, co-lead the round if it's uh, reasonable. Uh, a couple of times we've had terms that maybe we didn't agree with. Uh, we participated in less of a way, but very rarely. Uh, so you will see us go on to these to invest in these companies two, three, four times. So that's our general thesis is if one of these companies breaks out, we want to try to go from that 6% ownership, maybe to even 15 or 20% uh, if it's available. And we'll keep investing along the way. We uh, believe that this early stage investing is a team sport. Uh, and we uh, are very lucky to have a network of great investors who come every week. So over those 14 weeks, we have... You know, maybe 15 investors come every week. Then we do these demo days now. Everything is 100% remote. Uh, quite um, paradoxically or obviously, depending on uh, your belief system, we have seen three or four or five times as many companies wanting to come to the accelerator when it's remote, even though all the graduates said they would never go to an accelerator if it was remote. They wanted to have the in-person experience. So we're getting some mixed data there. Uh, obviously, the world's changed a bit, but we are um, highly active. Probably, we're, we're certainly more active than we've ever been during the pandemic. We believe this is a um, unique opportunity to get on the cap tables of great companies that need our support, and we have the dry powder. So we are uh, investing heavily. If you refer a company to us, and you can just do that by emailing Jackie or myself or anybody on our team, we will give you 10% carry share on that initial investment, which in the syndicate, uh, which if it's a syndicate company or an accelerator company can be a pretty good deal. Uh, we've done 15 or 16 of those carry share agreements. It's just a one letter agreement. We sign it, you sign it, and uh, then we're good. So we have a very, very tight uh, program today. We want this to be the ultimate hour of an investor's time. You get to see seven companies that we whittle down from a thousand applicants or so. So they represent 1% of our application pool typically, sometimes 2%, uh, but somewhere in that range. Um, we meet with 50 people in person, 75 people. Well, we used to meet with 75 people in person. We'd fly them out to pick the finalists uh, to, or to pick amongst the finalists to get to this group. So we give them only three minutes to present which is a lifetime if you want an overview, but obviously it's a very brief time if you want a deep dive. So this is the trailer of the startup. I encourage you all to, if you like the company, reach out to the founder and set up a meeting. We will be syndicating or have syndicated all of these companies. So if you're a member of the syndicate or you're in the launch, uh, if you're an LP uh, in our latest fund, I'll leave it at that, then uh, you have some exposure to these in some cases. So we'll get started. Jackie, tell me who's first. Fluent Forever is first. Great. So we have a thesis here. I'll, I'll, and one little punch up I'm doing here is to give you a 30 second 
um, preamble about the company while they put their deck up. So Gabe, you can go ahead and put your deck up. And while you're putting your deck up, uh, we believe in consumer subscription services. We've had great success with Calm, Steezy, uh, Tonebase, um, FitPod, and consumers are willing to pay for outcomes. And the outcome here is learning another language. With that, I give you Gabe from Fluent Forever. Three, two, go. All righty. Hey, everyone. I'm Gabe, founder of Fluent Forever, and I've built an app that can get you to fluency in a foreign language in six months. So the problem we're solving is a straightforward one. Most people in the world wish they could speak another language, and yet language learning tools don't work. And they don't work for three main reasons. They don't start with ear training. They're not focused on the right information. And then they don't repeat that information at the right rate so you can actually remember it long term. So let's start with ear training. Several years ago, I learned Hungarian to speak with my grandparents, and I hit this monster of a word. This is fényképezőgép. It's the word for camera. And if I distract you for literally two seconds, you will have forgotten that word. And that happens because fényképezőgép is composed of sounds that you've never learned how to hear. So ear training is your first barrier to entry, and there's a very quick fix for it. You just have to practice telling the difference between similar sounding words like doman, toma. So our app trains your ears and then builds personalized flashcards to help you remember that training. When you learn that P is for pelota, you choose your favorite pelota. And you do that because when you personalize your own content, it becomes much more effective. So we personalize everything that every user sees. And that takes us to learning the right information. When I told you that fényképezőgép was the word for camera, I wasted your time. Your word camera connects to every camera you've seen in your life. It connects to words like shutter, lens, iPhone 11, whereas fényképezőgép connects to nothing because translations are the least useful pieces of information about any word. So instead of translations, we're going to teach you your first words using images. And then we use fill in the blank sentences next to images to teach you more abstract things like the preposition en, in estar en llamas. The last piece is when should you repeat this stuff? And the answer is right before you forget it. There are algorithms that will figure that out and everything you do in our app lives within those algorithms. When you combine all these pieces, you get something that's allowing our users to reach levels of fluency that every other tool on the market can't even approach. Now, there are big players in this market because it's a huge and growing market, but there is research behind every one of our differentiators and they produce dramatically better churn rates than the competition. In terms of our early traction, my book on this became the only national bestseller about language learning in history. My crowdfunding campaign was the most successful crowdfunding for any app in history. And 14 months after launch, we're crossing 25,000 paying subscribers. This was our May monthly recurring, and this was June, we crossed 100K, and July's looking like another 20% growth month. This is a basic B2C play. It's 10 bucks a month, same pricing as Duolingo Premium. To hit 100 million ARR, we need 1 million customers. And ironically enough, some of the easiest to target customers are churned Duolingo users. We can access them directly on Facebook. We have built a brilliant 20 person team. My tech is led by a CTO who's led teams at Microsoft, Adobe and other companies for 25 years. And my background was in science and engineering before I became a professional opera singer, learned eight languages and started this company. And so that's our story. I'm Gabe, founder of Fluent Forever. And I built an app that can get you to fluency in six months. All right, great job, Gabe. All right, investors, I'm going to go around and get some questions from you. Also, from our syndicate members, if you want to go ahead and ask a question in the Q&A chat room, I'll try to get to those as well. Our YouTube um, stream viewers, if you want to go ahead and put your questions in your chat room, we'll try to get to those as well. All right, Ben Narison, let's start with you first. Do you have a question for Gabe? Sure. And can you and introduce should... yourself, Ben? It's for the investors, great. when I go around, introduce yourself, please. Ben Narison, I'm an investor at NEA, New Enterprise Associates, about a 42-year-old firm with 1,000 investments behind us, 225 IPOs, currently investing out of Fund 17, which is a $3.7 billion fund. Uh, Gabe, you mentioned it's a competitive space, Duolingo being one of the players, there's a bunch. Uh, I assume that part of your anchoring belief is that because you teach differently, you create more efficiency, that was sort of implied, if not overtly stated. If you do get me to fluency in six months, how do you retain me thereafter? Am I truly fluent without need for you again? Do you assume that I will go on to a second language or do you have a program to retain me? Because your, your turn is still high, even though it's not nearly as high as Duolingo. How do I see a long-term revenue stream from a customer through you? Cool. All right, great. Thanks, Ben. Bob Green, do you have a question for Gabe? Let's go on to Cindy. Cindy, question for Gabe. 
How about so you, you're Ellen? On mute. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm Ellen. I work with Honest Capital. We focus on seed stage and we have uh, over 300 portfolio companies. Uh, my question is about user growth. I understand that you want to get your initial user from this churn user from Duolingo and Facebook. And how do you plan to grow that after, you know, after you have the users, your initial user base? Thanks, Cindy. Jonathan Trieste. I am Jonathan Trieste uh, with Ludlow Ventures an early C stage uh, firm. Um, my question is, is I buy that you can, uh, with more efficiency, get someone to fluency. What about just engagement and content itself? I know that a lot of users turn not because they're not doing well, but because they're just bored. Can you speak to that a little bit? Okay, great. Jordan. Uh, the fundamentals on your CAC and LTV, especially in the economy where many of those is Expenditures are not necessarily going to be key for the consumer. And if you have something on the B2B model, if you have one at all. All right, thanks. And we have a question from our syndicate member. For when are you going to launch English, the second la language market in the world? Ready, Gabe? Cool. I'm ready. All right, let's tackle those. Two minutes, three to go. Cool. Um, so, Jordan, in terms of CAC and LTV, right now we're about 40 bucks, and it kind of doesn't matter where we send people. So we can send people to two-year subscriptions and immediately get about 50 bucks of profit from that, uh, or our monthly things, which are loss leaders, and we recoup that expense over a few months. Uh, and so we're doing all of the above. It targets different segments simultaneously. Uh, right now our spend is about 80K a month from Facebook, and we're trying to scale that by about 20% a month. Um, B2B plays right now focuses on B2C. We have some incoming B2B contracts that we're playing with as experiments, but like B2C is the focus of the company. Um, ben, you're asking about the six month drop, uh, like what happens after you hit fluency in six months? I try to be really specific, like clear with customers in terms of what we're able to deliver. Uh, I can deliver fluency, which is to say B2 level fluency in Spanish. You can really, really function, have conversations, be comfortable in six months if you're giving this thing an hour a day. What we find is the average user gives it about 15 minutes a day. And so that person is about two months, for, two years for Spanish. And if they're trying something like Russian, Russian is twice as hard as Spanish, takes twice as long. Japanese takes four times as long as that. Uh, and so we, we're upfront with that with our users. We want to be really, really clear and not do these over-promising things of saying you can get to any language in 10 days and you can speak this thing like uh, we deliver a real result in a real amount of time uh, and the average user is therefore able to get real value from us over a two-year span if they're giving us the average amount of dedication um, Jonathan you're asking about keeping people engaged and not bored um, we're seeing two things. One, as we deliver better results, people stick with us more. That's what that churn number means, really. I mean, we're not able to better, better gamify our app than Duolingo. And so they're sticking with us because of those results, because they're finding they're actually like thinking in French for the first time in their lives after like two weeks. Um, but longer term, the goal is to build out a second model, a $100 a month or $50 a month subscription that connects you to native speakers who are checking in with you on a regular basis and helping you practice on an ongoing basis. Um, Ellen, you're asking about user growth and where we go after Facebook. Next channel is Google Ads. Then we'll go off to, after Reddit and Trade Desk and things like that. Um, there's a lot of people out there who want to learn languages, and so we feel like there's, we're not going to run out of people anytime soon. All right, great job. All right, next up will be support pay. Jason? Uh, so uh, we love consumer subscriptions. Uh, everybody in the world loves SaaS. And we think that a new category that will emerge over time is productivity tools for uh, and software for consumers. So SaaS, the consumerization of SaaS or SaaS for consumers, however you want to say it, um, it's kind of a new zone. And we thought this was a founder with passion, building something meaningful in the world with passionate customers. And we always try to talk to those customers because that becomes a true North Star for us. If you're one of the syndicate members, I get that question often, like, how do you pick companies? How do you, how do you have a, a good hit rate? Well, customers generally don't lie. Um, yeah, and if you see their engagement and you see them using the product, kind of hard to fake. Uh, it can be done, but very rare. So with that, uh, support pay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sherry Atwood, and I'm the founder and CEO of Support Pay. We help parents manage child support and share expenses directly with each other. I'm a child of a divorce, so when I went through my own marriage, I swore that I would never put my daughter through what I went through. Unfortunately, as a successful Silicon Valley executive, I did face a divorce, but I did it myself. It 
in order to eliminate a lot of the arguments. But what I didn't understand back then was how complicated child support is. See, most people, when they think of child support, they think about it as a once a month payment. But in actuality, there's all these additional expenses that parents have to share, like childcare, medical, education, or anything deemed special needs for the kids. And this turns into a lot of issues and a lot of arguments. And I wasn't the only one out there with this problem. In fact, in the US alone, there's 55 million parents who live apart. I was out there searching for a solution and shocked that there was nothing out there. Then I started talking to other parents. Meet Tracy. She is a single mom of Madison, Lexi, and Logan, and she was trying to deal with all their additional expenses with her ex, Larry. So you had Madison's braces or Lexi's cheerleading or Logan's uh, football. And then it became all these Google spreadsheets and this calculations back and forth, all of this receipts trying to manage and share them, these emails and text messages, and it just became a nightmare until they found support pay. With support pay, they have all of their information, expenses, and payments in a single certified system. A parent logs in, they can upload a receipt, the system scans the receipt, and then populates uh, who it's for, where the item is, enters the amount, and automatically calculates how much each parent owes. Then the system sends the notification to the other parent where they can log in from the web or mobile app. They can review the item, see the receipt, dispute it if they want, or most importantly, if they agree, they can make or schedule a payment right there. Now they have all of their information in one certified location, eliminating all of the arguments that happen between parents. Tracy says, it's amazing. I don't have to call, text, email, and nag him for him to pay his share. And he finally understands how expensive his kids really are. And Larry says, now he knows where his money is going and he has a certified record. Not to mention their divorce attorney says they're including support pay in all of their child support orders because it gives them the data they need in order to help their clients. The way that we make money is a basic subscription model starting at $7.99 a month or $79 a year plus transaction fees. We have over 27,000 users, 1,600 of them are paid, and we just hit 23,000 in MRR. We did that all on zero marketing expense using search and SEO, as well as partnerships with family law professionals. But how do we get to 100 million? It's simple. We continue and double down on search and SEO, our partnerships with family law, getting into the orders or agreements, and through paid ads, all ran by an incredible team with over 200 years of, of experience in order to help children get the financial support they deserve from both parents. I'm Sherry Atwood, and I'm the founder of, C of Support Pay. I look forward to your questions. All right. Great job, Sherry. Investors, Lolita, could you please introduce yourself and your question for Sherry? Yeah, Lolita Taub, and I'm a venture partner in NextGen Venture Partners. Um, my question to you is, who is paying for the subscription? Okay, thank you. Pippa, welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pippa Lam. I'm a partner at Sweet Capital, which is the VC fund set up by the founders of Candy Crush. Uh, so just to the previous uh, presenter, we love all things gamification. So very cool. Um, my question is, tell me a little bit more about your go-to-market. You mentioned some potential partnerships or distributions through law firms, but tell me about how you're acquiring those customers beyond SEO. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Ravi from Parade. Hi, I'm Ravi, an investor at Parade, new early stage fund focusing on seed and pre-seed. My question is more about churn and kind of the main reasons for it. All right, thanks. Robert, Maven. Hey everyone, I'm Robert Ravon Shanoz from Maven Ventures. We're a early stage consumer focused fund. My question for you, Sherry, is on market size. So 55 million parents, does that equate to half as many couples? And is that market growing or not growing in the US right now? All right, great. And let's take one from the syndicate, from Raf. In order to grow to 100 million, have you guys considered opening this platform to couples without children that just want to keep their finances separate? This would help them have a joint account. So great. let's take those. Two it's minutes. Gave me a ton. So starting with uh, Lolita, who pays? Great question. I didn't want who paid to be yet another argument point. So each parent pays independently. There is a premium version. There's also a free light version so that they can choose independently who pays. And that also gives us the opportunity to monetize on both sides. Uh, I'll address uh, Robert's question on the market size. So uh, this market is growing and it's growing substantially while people, especially millennials, tend are choosing not to get divorced 
course, people are still having children. And in fact, since COVID, our daily registrations have tripled without any additional uh, marketing expense. They believe or are predicting that the uh, separation or divorce rate will skyrocket in the next six months. They've already shown that in China. So while... um, the maybe people aren't getting divorced as often there this is a continuous uh, market that can people will continuously have children and unfortunately uh, continuously separate which also goes into the question about is that really just half of those have couples and the answer is no in fact 33 percent of parents in the u.s have multiple children by multiple parents so it's parents uh, blended families married divorced step parents um, and then they still have children and you have to think that this spans at least 18 years, if not longer. Um, So that helps us in order to target that market. And then from a go-to-market perspective, uh, we started just simply with search. Uh, Right now we're doing a, paid ads and there's so much traffic out there that we're blowing our budget by 10 a.m. every morning only focusing on 10 states. So the the demand is high just from parents, but more importantly, uh, getting into the order or agreement, partnering with family law, lawyers, mediators, judges, financial advisors, getting into the order uh, when it happens says that they have to use us and then they have to use us long term, which is addresses the churn question. Number one reason why people churn is because they get into an argument about something else. So by getting into the order and them agreeing up front, it sort of locks them in. Thank you. All right, great job. Next up will be V1. Okay, so everybody knows that no code is a thing and everybody wants to build apps. But if you talk to anybody who's doing no code, pretty great for websites, pretty bad experience for apps. And if you speak to anybody who's non-technical, getting an app done uh, by outsourcing it, still a very painful process. And when we saw the customers of this company, the early customers were actually having an outcome, right? And so when a founder makes a product, we, we listen to their vision and we try to listen very deeply and, and be present for that. Once we hear what their vision is, we start to ask questions about, well, what is the outcome for the customers? And then we try to see if the product is actually um, hitting the outcome, whether the outcome is divorced couples being able to discuss money <laughs> without uh, killing each other or people who um, want to learn a language, actually learning a language, or people with meditation and calm being able to actually reduce their anxiety and get to bed and stop doom scrolling. I'm speaking, of course, of myself. Uh, so we, when we looked at the outcomes here, we were very impressed. And we thought this is a very promising, interesting approach. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jeremy. Three, two, go. Thanks, JKL. I am Jeremy Redman, founder of V1, and we are the easiest no-code platform to launch any app. So everyone has an app idea, but right now only 4% of people know how to even navigate a CMS. This is the current view of an industry leader in visual development. And as you see, every square inch of this screen is filled with something someone has to learn. Another competitor of ours, Bubble, who builds mobile web apps, I akin this to Photoshop and with that, the learning curve or the design learning curve that comes with learning Photoshop. They claim 430,000 registered users, but around 10,000 monthly active users. I see that as 420,000 people who gave up trying. Compare us to Canva. There's a very little slight learning curve in building something and building your designs in Canva. Here, take a look. Anyone can come in here without giving us an email address, connect their Shopify store, pull in a feed within minutes. We have a direct connection to uh, Airtable as well. They can change the layout, change anything that they want, go to their Airtable base with full integration to change anything. And here's an amazing thing. We have a members only screen that protects content. You can unlock and lock if you want. Even in Webflow, you can still have to drag and drop code, which is kind of frustrating. How do we teach those people? This is what something spits out. And then we have something called X-ray mode that gives people tips and tricks that brings the newbies to experienced developers. They only pay $8 to start, 
or $79 when they start to grow. These pricing plans are new and we have ridden them to over 30,000 in monthly revenue. Our beachhead market right now is college incubators and accelerators. They are very resource constrained and they, they are very picky. So we learn a lot from them. We've also experimented with business newsletters uh, locally uh, in LA and beyond. We've really tried to have that customer service approach. And because of that, we've earned a 48% referral rate. People love us. This is the competitive landscape. Uh, to a new competitor, Glide, they raised some money last year. They're very template-based. The learning curve is slightly lower. At the same time, very templated. Bubble, neither one of these two push native apps either. And we allow people to export source code and go on their journey with them. We will enable 100x more creators with what we're doing because, again, the other platforms with the learning curves essentially are only helping the 4% of people that already know how to navigate a CMS. My CTO was the 13th employee at Box. Brian was the first employee at Zapier. And I am Jeremy Redman, and we are the easiest no-code platform ever. All right. Great job, Jeremy. Okay. Investor questions. Ben, we're back to you. Ben Narison. Sure. It's, a, it's interesting. This is something that's been around. I invested in a company that did this about six years ago uh, when iPhones first started to popularize apps. So what I'd like to understand is you showed two things. You showed a pretty limited competitive landscape, but there are a lot of dead bodies here. Maybe speak a little bit more to the past and what hasn't worked and what has. And secondly, use cases. You mentioned connecting to Shopify. You mentioned experimenting with newsletters. You know, what are sort of the core use cases you are seeing right now for the people to actually have their apps do. All right. Thanks, Ben. Uh, let's try you. Cindy, are you there? And I think yeah, we had I'm trouble there. unmuting your lesson. Oh, great. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Cindy. I've been investing for uh, almost 10 years. I actually invested in Zapier. Uh, so you've got a strong team because a uh, Zapier early team member. So um, my question is, you are raising $0.7 million. What's your plan to invest that money? All right. Thanks. Ellen, question? Uh, I think it's a subscription model. So how do you uh, keep the users staying in your platform after they complete building the, uh, the app? Okay, thanks. Jonathan Trieste. Uh, my questions were really similar to Ben's. I guess really how do you differentiate with so much noise? Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Question from Richard Syndicate. It, so it's just for mobile apps? Is this question? You want to take those, Jeremy? Yep. All right, through to go. Okay, so yes, there are so many dead bodies and there are also new entrants like AWS's Honey Code. And I gotta say, it's absolute trash. Why? Because these solutions are built by engineers, okay? I'm a no-coder myself building this no-code platform and I've done a lot of research on every single builder that's out there. And if you follow the trail, they are all led by technical people and early on, especially a few years ago, every no-code platform started with the notion of helping developers develop faster, right? They were, and they just kind of like backed into helping non-technical people. That's why they failed. And that's why we will win. We are the only no-code app builder led by an actual no-coder. Uh, use cases, we've had... We've uh, actually experimented with an embed uh, module that people can adjust their app on the fly. The possibilities are truly endless if it's in React Native. Um, and then they can export their so source code for an added fee and build onto it as well. Um, we've had anything from like a machine learning, like counting push-ups piece to a Shopify store to small businesses that are tired of DoorDash or Postmates prices. Um, how do we plan to use the money? We are using it right now to uh, experiment more with marketing. The channels that we have experimented with, we're putting more into them, uh, but finding that real coin-based operating system and also having some resources to build out the customer support team to handle the demand that we currently have. Uh, the subscription-based model, uh, yes, it's a subscription-based model. We give a steep discount for annual uh, our lifetime value on the new plan is about 300 bucks and we acquired them for 15. 
So we're pretty good there. And we've really focused on starting and launching. 90% of ideas fail. Those people will come back. Thank you. Great job. All right, next up will be Freedrum. Jason? Okay, so hardware is hard. Subscriptions for consumers, I wouldn't say are easy, but they're certainly easier. And when we saw this company, we said, wow, yeah, they, they've suffered through the hardware part of this. They've de-risked that for us, and now they're launching a subscription product. So we see this as part of our HaaS, hardware as a service category. Uh, Density was a company that we syndicated for syndicate members who remember six years ago, they were at our conference doing people count. That company's done phenomenal. In fact, it, um, uh, I think Jonathan Treese is here and he was an early investor in the company as well with me. Um, and so we see this as something new. Hardware enabled subscriptions gives you a little more defensibility, makes the product a little more unique, gives you a retail presence, uh, but allows you to capture that subscription model, which is critical. Okay, three, two, go. I'm George from Freedrum, and we're making the smartest way to learn music. I'd love to show you what we've made so far. So drums are great, but they're large and loud, and lessons are inconvenient and expensive. So we created a hardware and software solution which is small, quiet, and affordable, and allows users to gather insights into how accurately and effectively they're practicing and learning. We originally brought the product to market in 2017 via a Kickstarter campaign that raised over $620,000. Since then, we've shipped over 13,000 units globally and generated over $2.5 million in revenue. To drive our company, we've started with a simple business model where we offer the product in two SKUs and almost 90% of our customers opt for the more expensive $245 version, which includes full access to the current software. We make 75% margin on our current cost of goods. Most people assume our product is for beginners when in fact we have a wide range of intermediate and professional users. Our primary channels of acquisition are Google and Facebook ads, and our cost of acquisition is just under $32. In addition, we built a very strong brand following within the music community. Air drumming is real now. It's like you're there, it's like you can feel the drum. Free drums, they're amazing, man. You can open hi-hats by lifting your foot above the ground. I felt really good, actually. The thing I like about it is that it's, it's pretty mobile and easy. This is traveling. You can travel right away. The concept, air drums, is really old, but this is not air. This is air with flavor. So to grow our company's venture scale, we're shifting to a subscription business model and starting with a price point of $9.99. We're doing this by adding learning and peer-to-peer -peer functionality to our software. Our key differentiator is that we'll teach you to play using your own favorite music instead of relying on pre-recorded content. Users will play a song using their premium subscription model, and our software pulls the drumming stem and visualizes the notation. The app will tell you how accurately you played, where you went wrong, and once you've mastered the song, what to play next based on your preferences. We then provide analytical insights to make sure you improve and allow you to easily share your progress and stats amongst your network. We're essentially doing for music what Peloton and Mirror have done for home fitness. Now the market opportunity is there. Based on sales, demand for guitars is four times larger than drums. So by applying our hardware and software approach to e-learning over to other instruments, we're going after a total addressable market of just over $7.5 billion. Our numbers don't lie. Two weeks into the third quarter, and we've already blown past last year's revenue. Our year-on-year -year quarterly growth is over 200% at this point. And at this rate, we'll be tripling our annual revenue in 2020 as we head into the holiday season. Our team is small, but we're deep in R&D experience. We're repeat founders that have bootstrapped this company and run it profitably since day one. And finally, we're highly mission-driven music enthusiasts. I'm George from Freedrum, and we're making the smartest way to learn music. Thank you. All right, great job, George. All right, investors, Jordan. Jordan, you next with a question for George. I'm a pass. Beach C isn't my key. Okay, Lolita. A quick question on the distribution. Well, actually, uh, my question's on how has COVID impacted and this whole work from home world impacted your business? Pippa. Hey, um, how big can this market really be? And second of all, 
how much work is it time and money for you to take what you've learned so far with drums and apply it to the other instruments that you're planning to roll out? Great. Ravi. Could you talk a little bit more about how feedback works when using this product? Okay, Robert. Could you clarify the business model? You said you're moving to software for $9.99 a month. How does the customer pay for or acquire the, the drum, the, the hardware that attached to the drumsticks? Great. Actually, and Jonathan Trias, did you have a question? I do. Actually, I've been playing drums since I was five, so I'm a big drummer. I'm really curious. Uh, one, without a, like surface contact, like how, what's that like for the person playing drums since like you're not actually hitting anything? And two, how do you make it like a really serious, effective piece of hardware versus like a fun or gimmicky toy? Uh, it looks super cool, but it, you're going to have to really figure out how to differentiate there. All right, let's take those, George. You ready? Yeah, absolutely. Those are great questions. Um, great. So, Robert, first, the pricing model. Pretty simple. We're offering it. We're starting off with two sort of versions. The first one is a non-committal where you'd pay $49 up front. You'd get the hardware, and then you could cancel at any time. It's you know a simple month-to-month -month play. Alternatively, you'd sign up for an annual uh, subscription that would be heavily discounted, plus you'd get, um, you'd get the hardware included in that. Uh, Ravi, feedback. Um, that's, that's part of the special source because what we're competing against is a wide variety of companies that have done this before and even to some degree YouTube, which does it for free. Uh, the key difference is, is that with all of these alternatives, they're only presenting you the content. It's still up to you to figure out whether you're playing this right or wrong. Because we've got that hardware lock-in, we can simply create that closed loop where the system can detect how you're doing it right or wrong, you know, whether the song you're trying to learn from is, is too advanced and whether you should move to something you know, simpler or perhaps even push yourself a little bit harder. Um, Pippa, to some degree that does, I think, address your question as to how much work is it to expand over to other instruments. Um, I think one thing that can be you know, like an easy gap to fall into is that you know, we talk about it being very portable and quiet and all that kind of stuff. And the real key is, is the fact that we have this very unique approach to learning where we're using a song-based learning as opposed to content-based. And the reason why we did that is because we researched our customers, everything from beginners through to pros, and that we're building on existing behavior. Um, so we're essentially taking that part of it and moving it over onto other instruments. Now, MIDI guitars have existed for a while. There are MIDI microphones. So the platform is there, like the basis is there to move over onto other instruments. Um, we're simply applying our special source, you know, over onto that. Lolita, you asked about how COVID has affected our business. Um, it's been a double-edged sword. Generally, it's been good, you know, for better or for worse. Uh, the negative side of things is that, of course, our retail business completely shut down. Uh, we had a lot of momentum there, but that totally stopped. But, um, you know, at the same time, we just accelerated and focused really hard on our e-commerce marketing. So we have managed to grow the business, um, you know, steadily through there. And then, John, finally, uh, surface contact. Yes, in the current version, that is a negative. In the new version of the hardware that you saw a rending of, we will be including haptic feedback. And I'm out of time, so I'd love to talk to you more about how this is a serious learning tool. Thank you very much, guys. All right, that's great. Thanks, George. Okay, next up is Formulate. Okay, so direct-to-consumer is really hard. Um, I think everybody has some experience in scar tissue and investing in direct to consumer, really hard to get to 500 to a million, really hard to get from a million to 10 and certainly 10 to 100 million, really hard. Uh, we've done a number of investments there and done um, okay, I would say it's, it's challenging. And as we study the space, what we find is differentiated products, products that are very unique and um, founders who really, um, understand the customers and how to market to them, their audience are the ones who win. So if you were to draw that, you know, classic X, Y, you know, or a four quadrant, very differentiated product and a founder who really understands how to market it, uh, that seems to be the sweet spot. And we think Formulate uh, is something with mass customization and a founder who, who really understands data science um, and, influencers and subscriptions and the customer uh, is going to do pretty well and has done pretty well so far. So three, two, go.
In the future, every product that you put on your skin and in your hair will be customized, made to order, and better for you. The simple truth is that the ingredients already exist to solve the world's skin and hair and scalp issues. It's just about delivering the right ingredients at the right levels for each person. My name is Ooze, I'm the founder of Formulate, and we are your own personal chemists. We started with that simple question, what does the future of personal care look like? And then we spent three years to build a platform that powers that future. One where you can open up your phone and communicate with a chemist to customize all of your products and routines. So here's how it works. This is Jessica. She's 31 and spent her entire life looking for the right products. This is a real co customer, but I'm using some stock photos. She has unique hair and she's been dealing with an itchy scalp for years. She gets acne frequently, has keratosis polaris, and has a citrus allergy. She hears about Formulate and decides to give it a try. And in three months, she's raving about how Formulate changed her life. So here's how it happened. Jessica visits Formulate. She answers a few questions about herself, like how sensitive is your scalp? 50% of Americans like Jessica are dealing with scalp issues that are actually easily resolvable with right formulations. So she plays her order and receives her first formulas within a few days. And on our back end, Formulate builds her profile. She uses more shampoo than conditioner. So Formulate predicts when she'll run out and automatically creates a customized subscription for her. Her 30 initial data points are stored in our evolving customer property storage system. She had an itchy scalp. All this data is then used to customize her initial formulas. And Formulate keeps a version-controlled history of her formulas as they change for her over time. And when they're dispensed, a production record is stored in history with real-time costing and complete ingredient lot traceability. After she receives her set, she downloads the Formulate app where she can manage her entire personal care routine. She can chat with her chemistry team and soon her medical providers, modify her subscriptions, and learn about the ingredients in her formulas. She can also change her fragrance and allergy settings. Finding products that avoid allergies is a pain point for 10 million Americans. And in two weeks, Formulate pings her for feedback. So her scalp feels great, but she wishes she could have a bit more frizz control. Our platform learns from each piece of feedback and iterates on her formulas until they're perfectly dialed in for her. We've created a purpose-built ERP that powers everything from our customized dispensing equipment all the way to real-time inventory management and satisfaction reporting. We made a launch last year with just a shampoo and, and conditioner subscription. We have now 28,000 customers with 60% margins. But most importantly, we demonstrated that our platform works. We built better products over time by combining flexible manufacturing with customer feedback. We've gone from 38% initial satisfaction to over 70%, which led to 400% growth in our retention rates over that same period. And 2020 has really been our breakout year. We tripled since February. We're now at a $1.8 million run rate. Formulate will be a platform to manage your entire personal care routine. We started in hair care and we're moving into skincare later this year. But the broader vision is to license our platform as a tool for public health and wellness. Love to invite you all to experience Formulate. You can visit us at formulate.co slash launch for 25% off until tomorrow. Again, I'm Ooze. I'm the founder of Formulate and we are your own personal chemist. Thanks. All right. Awesome, Ooze. Investors, back to you, Ben. Question for Ooze. Great. How can you talk a little bit more about the feedback loop? You mentioned that you get pinged for, with a certain set of questions. Just maybe a bit more detail on how actively you're connecting to the people, and more importantly, I think to me, the compliance. You know, what percentage of the people that buy the product are then willing to give you that feedback, and then how does that impact reorder? All right. Thanks, Cindy. Question for Uz. Hey. Um, so, for your customer outrage. Um, do you have more female customers than male or more curly and straight? So what about the gender and the race um, distribution for your customer base? And uh, your, your plan to target them more? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Ellen, question for Uz. Uh, um, so what's the key message of your product and how does it differentiate from products like Pros? And also how do you plan to build a community for your product? All right, great. We have a couple syndicate questions. Uh, what is your average gross margins over the last six months? And how many different SKUs does Formulate currently have? It's a lot of news. Ready to take this? All right, no problem, yeah. Uh, ben, so I'll talk about the feedback loop, how it actually works. 86% of our customers download an app, the, the Formulate app, after buying the product. 50% actually do end up providing feedback. That's something we're, we're looking to obviously increase because anybody that leaves feedback is, is, is twice as likely to continue forward, even if they had a neg negative experience. The, qu the questions right now are about six questions. We ask about how you like the fragrance. Um, and if you didn't like the fragrance, why you didn't like it, was it too weak, too strong, uh, or you just didn't like the smell. And then we ask about the overall product. Uh, we also allow you to provide feedback, uh, free text feedback, uh, but then we also apply structure. So if you're having issues like frizziness, as you saw, we apply structure to that. So we're capturing all that data. 
Um, and yeah, so there's a push notification through the app for those customers. Cindy, so right now it's about 93% female uh, women in America, 25 to 40. We did launch the Formulate Hem line targeting men uh, about two months ago, seeing some great success. We do believe that in the long run, uh, personalization will be ubiquitous. So it will follow the same trend that we see with custom golf clubs, where previously only pros would use custom golf clubs, but now it's it's kind of the norm, it's standard. This is what we expect even for the customer base that you wouldn't consider skin or hair crazy or, or very into that. Uh, so in the long run, we expect this to apply really to the masses, uh, including if you want to say for men who may not uh, take take the time to really focus on finding the right products. Ellen, the uh, key, key differentiator or key message for the consumer is that we're your own personal chemist. We're a pocket chemist. So something that never existed before is the ability to open up your phone, talk to a chemist or talk to a platform that can actually materially evolve your product over time. So this is fundamentally different than buying one product, moving on to the next, moving on to the next, where all of that feedback and knowledge is lost and experience. We're actually capturing that over time. You have the ability to open up your phone and talk, talk to a chemist to have your product changed. From, from a differentiation differentiation standpoint compared to a company like pros we're the only company in personalization to build emulsion level customization so taking that tied in with feedback allow if you were to look at our slope of satisfaction over time it has allowed us to become better and better faster than any other company to date that's all the time i have sorry i'll get to your questions hopefully after the after this thank you please all right next up is soul savvy okay so uh, we all know that community is uh, a major driver of commerce in the world, and we all know that social networks are too big and, you know, the loudest, most obnoxious voices in the world kind of take over Twitter and Facebook, et cetera. And so we think that communities uh, are going to become an opportunity, specifically paid communities. And we've been saying for a long time that Twitter should have a paid product or Facebook, or I've been saying that for a decade, uh, a paid tier. And when we saw Soul Savvy and what they were doing using Slack as a community to drive uh, the top one or 2% of sneaker uh, purchasers to have their own community that they're willing to pay for at a very high level, superhuman uh, email level payments, uh, we thought this was a really interesting business that we could learn a lot from. And so this is a wild card in the group. It doesn't fit into the previous categories. So take note of uh, this is not no code. This is not, you know, consumer subscription. This is not SaaS. This is not a marketplace. This is something new. Just pay attention, everybody. Three, two, go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dion, co-founder of Soul Savvy, and we're building the future of the sneaker industry. Soul Savvy is a community and platform built on top of Slack for people who love buying sneakers. Think of us as a digital Soho house crossed with Amazon Prime, but we don't hold any inventory. The core of our business is simple. We offer $30 monthly subscriptions. Our revenues reach $52,000 in MRR with 2,000 subscribers. That's a 30% increase in subscriber growth this past quarter and a 40% increase in MRR over that same period. We're growing organically and consistently, which has us pacing to double our MRR by December. So why do customers join? We help them save money and buy sneakers at their retail cost with no premiums. Like this Yeezy, which on average resells for $60 above retail, or this Jordan 1, which resells for a premium of $100. For some context, those shoes were purchased 1.5 million times on StockX last year. That works out to a ridiculous $120 million in just premium spent on two shoes on one marketplace. This brings me to Chris. He became a member last year because he was tired of paying those same premiums. We made it possible for him to buy this Jordan in seconds. Once a sneaker is released anywhere in the world, we notify Chris instantly through Slack notifications. All he has to do is open his phone, select his size, and he's taken directly to checkout to complete the purchase at an authorized retailer. We combine our tools with a decade of experience to ensure every member becomes an expert along the way. And our community adds value to our core product offering because of the connections members build with each other and with us. We are building brand loyalty that sets our business apart. Soul Savvy is a place where people can come together and they just happen to do it over sneakers. To give you an idea of how far that loyalty goes, we designed our own premium sneaker and sold 300 units for $600 each. Our mission is to capitalize on a market that's already reached 80 billion and just getting started. So much so that a $6 billion market has grown on top of it because demand and interest is so high. And interestingly enough, the secondhand shopping market is expected to go to 64 billion in the next five years. The platform we're building leverages our brand loyalty to help drive our future as we monetize every single aspect of the sneaker industry. 
once we acquire a customer, their value to us is incredible. Even through COVID, our churn has stayed at 4%. Our customers are very engaged. They use our community as a replacement for social media, and because of that, they are tuned into everything we communicate. That engagement allows us to directly target the most active consumers online. In just 20 days this month, our subscribers spent almost $400,000 on products. We've bootstrapped this to date, and we're just getting started. The upside within the industry is massive, and we're building a brand that will become a global name. And I know I've talked a lot about sneakers today, but don't get stuck on the word sneakers. These consumers who are spending $200 on shoes will also spend on everything else. The foundation of our company is two founders with decades of combined experience in e-com and retail, but forget what we look like because this is the real us. Uh, we love sneakers and the culture surrounding it. Once again, my name is Dion, co-founder of Soul Savvy. All right. Great job, Dion. Jonathan Triest, question for Dion. Uh, really cool. Well, I'm, I'm actually here in Detroit and an investor in StockX, so love the space and congrats. Um, I'm curious, uh, are the, is the average user someone who's already a Slack user, or are they first onboarding Slack for the first time just to use Soul Savvy? Thanks. Jordan? I'm sorry, I don't do B2C, but I love the idea, I love the concept, but uh, no B2C for me. Okay, thanks. How about you, Lolita? Yeah, I have a quick question on community. Are you leveraging the community to bring on more customers? Pippa? Tell me about your envision. You know, does this sit on Slack forever or do you see yourself building out your own platform? And if so, what would that look like? Thanks. How about you, Ravi? Yeah, do you, allow, do you allow anyone to join? And like, how do you kind of uh, maintain quality in the community? And Robert. Uh, Ravi asked my question. Okay. And we have a question um, from Richard. Doesn't GOAT already own this market? Ready to take those, Dion? Yes. Okay. That's a lot. Three to go. Yeah. Uh, so to start in the question of GOAT, GOAT does not own, own this market. The only market GOAT and StockX own right now is the secondary market of people um, paying a premium to buy products. That's what this whole industry has turned into and that's what it's all about. There's nothing enabling consumers and helping them succeed and also enjoy their experience in purchasing a product. No one likes to go to GOAT or StockX. They don't care which one they go to. They just want the best discount and the cheapest price, price ultimately, not a discount. So we're differentiating in the, in the um, fact of the first time you see a product to when you buy it, that is our space. That is what we're monetizing and that's where we're working in and building towards that second part of marketplace because the hardest part about having a marketplace is actually acquiring the users who want to use it and trust you and that's a whole nother discussion. But um, Jonathan, average user is already not on Slack. It is part of our onboarding process. Um, you know, We have users who are 55 who got into sneakers the first time they saw Michael Jordan play basketball and uh, are coming back into it and we onboard them into Slack. Some users uh, are a little bit more of a challenge to do that. Some uh, work at corporations that use Slack and they're super excited about that. So it's kind of a mix and, you know, it is part of our process. Um, Jordan, so we do leverage our community. Our growth is really based on organic. Um, daily members are you know, contacting us and saying, hey, I would like to refer a friend because we're on a wait list. We use the wait list to manage our flow, make sure we're vetting people, which kind of comes into Ravi's question. But um, community is important to us and having good customers uh, in the community is what makes it succeed and brings everyone together. And there's something beautiful about the fact that you paid $30 to be able to use this, that it comes with accountability and ownership that you'll never find on Twitter or Facebook because people just say outlandish shit. And um, that doesn't happen here because it's just a really tight knit group of people who believe in that power of community together. Um, Pippa, as far as Slack forever, um, you know, it's what we're exploring. Uh, part of me feels like for the platform to succeed in, you know, monetizing and understanding the full data and everything that's happening from the user engaging with us to the transaction happening and how we can leverage that to make a better experience. It, it most likely will need to be on its own. Um, infrastructure and own platform, but right now it's working really well for us and we don't have a reason to stop. So we're going to keep pushing towards that until we foresee um, a bump in the road and I am out of time. Thank you. Thanks, Dion. Okay. And our seventh founder is All right. Outlaw. Doing, making great time here. So again, back to D to C, uh, consumer, direct consumer. We like uh, companies that have founders with 
a very deep understanding of their customers and a very differentiated product. And so we felt Outlaw Soaps had that when we talked to their customers and we looked at their data, um, we saw their sales. And uh, we're big fans of the product personally. Uh, we, we just, one of the big hacks uh, as an investment team that we unlocked long ago was to just use products. And if you use the products, boy, do you get a lot of information. And the information we got from this one was, we now understand why consumers are so crazy about it and they keep reordering. So with that, Danielle, you have three minutes on the clock. Three, two, go. Awesome. Let me get this started. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Danielle Vincent. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Outlaw. We make personal care and home fragrance for people who want to smell like campfire, whiskey, leather, and the great outdoors. Last year, we found our product market fit and grew by more than 320% last year. Uh, this year, even with moving from California to Nevada and a global pandemic, we're already at more than 240% uh, year to date, driven, as you can see, by a huge surge in direct-to-consumer sales. Our cost per acquisition has dropped to nearly $2 and our average order value and our lifetime customer value has stayed strong. Last year, we did 1.2 million in sales. This year, we're on track for 4 million in sales. Uh, we're primarily a direct-to-consumer brand selling on liveoutlaw.com, and we use Amazon and wholesale for discovery. It's marketing with an upside. Our wholesale accounts are all very strategic. For example, Whole Foods gives our natural product claims credence, and we're selling through so well there that they're picking up more of our products next month. We have a differentiated product, fanatical customers, a low cost per acquisition, really high margins, and we're poised for exponential growth with your help. Our margins are 70%, industry standards 35%. So these are more like software margins than grocery margins. And of course, we've attracted major press in the last few months. Men's Journal, Esquire, Forbes, and Outside have all written really nice things about us, and our customers write about us too. Now that I found you, I'm never using anything else. Marty's sentiment is not uncommon. It's because our scents are so differentiated. Our scents are any unlike anything else on the market today. For example, we have things like The Gambler, which is inspired by bourbon, tobacco, and leather, to Home on the Range, inspired by uh, blackberries, fresh cut grass, and fresh laundry. Each scent is available across several different product types, so when somebody finds their signature scent, they're never using anything else, and these consumable products lend themselves perfectly to subscriptions. We relaunched our subscriptions in March and have more than doubled our monthly recurring revenue since then. This is what the next five years looks like. We're going to continue to focus on direct-to-consumer, including subscriptions and uh, Amazon. And then in 2023, we'll pivot slightly, start focusing more on wholesale, get our volume up, our cost down, and get over that $100 million mark in 2024. But this is just the beginning. Our total addressable market is more than $3 billion. Where does this customer fanaticism and data-driven product development come from? Oprah. Prior to Outlaw, I was the digital product manager for Oprah, ABC, and ABC Family. I managed the launch of all three of those websites and the communities. And my husband and co-founder, Russell, is a production badass. He scaled us to 100,000 units and kept us legal. Our board is all from major CPG, Nestle, Nissan, Wonka, and more. Errol, uh, Al Multari said Outlaw is the best run company of its size I've ever seen. Daryl said Outlaw is a defensible, expandable platform. Everyone has an inner Outlaw and personal care is just the beginning. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. All right. Thanks, Danielle. Okay. Back over to Ben Narison. Question for Danielle. Very cool product. I assume Jason's a big user of the gambler. It seems like it fits him. Um, I usually don't ask this, but I'm intrigued by what you think about exit possibilities. You know, it's, you know, there's obviously a lot of need in the CPG space. And you saw things like Tom's and Bird's Bees and others where they started with a very authentic and specific effort being acquired to bring that authenticity to larger brands. So how do you think about the long-term view of where do you end up here? Thanks. Cindy. Yeah, I want to ask about the manufacturing. Uh, is it like domestically made or uh, you, uh, you do international uh, for lower cost? Ellen. Oh, uh, Cindy actually asked my question, but I think it's a very cool product. Thank you. Jonathan? I don't have any questions, but I'm on the site buying gifts for everyone I know. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Jordan. 
I love the product. I'm a user, so I'm a little biased. Um, I think that's that's the future for for this market. Uh, I will always go back to the CAC LTV ratios. These are the key indicators. Okay, Lolita. No questions. Okay, we have a couple from the um, GS Surrey from the syndicate asks, how do you think about reducing margin to drive retention and test to max customer value? All right, and, is that ready? Uh, Can I yeah, let's take those. All right, all right, awesome. So Ben, I'll start with yours. Yeah, um, I agree. This is um, definitely something we've thought about. I have largely taken the Burt's Bees business model and used them as a template. Roxanne Quimby is one of my personal heroes. And I read her book about her journey uh, every single week. So we've thought about it. I think that this is the kind of product that a large company just can't create. We are, you know, really, really values driven. We have a natural focus. We have incredibly fanatical customers. And we have a renegade, like, you know, outlaw. When somebody's an outlaw, they really love expressing their inner outlaw. So I think this is really, a, this is a possibility for that. But I also think that this has a long-term business potential as well. So, you know, we're open to talking about that. That's something that Jason and I have talked about too. Um, and Cindy and Ellen, manufacturing. So we are committed to U.S. manufacturing. We um, ha did a lot of our manufacturing in-house early on, and this money is actually going to help us continue to outsource our large volume products so that we are poised for scale. Because for us, scalability is really important. We also are committed to US uh, sourced products. So our fragrance oils are all made in the US and governed by FDA regulations, stuff like that. Um, it's something that's important to our customers and important to us, um, as is our low, low waste um, commitment and cruelty-free cosmetics. Um, our cost um, per acquisition and our lifetime Customer value ratio, I completely agree, Jordan. This is like, there's some performance indicators that are just the things to watch for CPG companies. And that's really, like, you've nailed it. That's exactly what it is. And so we're really focused on getting our lifetime customer value or uh, up, which is why we relaunched those subscriptions. We're using this time while people are experiencing huge transition in their buying preferences to build market share. And that's my time. So please contact me afterwards. I'm Danielle at liveoutlaw.com. Thanks. All right. Great job, all the founders. Uh, this is the hard part. We're going to ask you, our investor judges, for your top three, your number three, your number two, and your number one. And you can pick up to four honorable mentions uh, of the seven. After you pick your three, two, and one, you cannot have a tie. Uh, and this is through the lens of you would be most interested in meeting for a follow-up meeting or investing in or getting updates from. So it's from an investment lens, not your favorite product, but as an investor, we want to know which are your favorite companies in terms of opportunity. We keep track of this over time. And the cohorts here at launch get to see how they're doing versus um, their contemporaries. And what inevitably happens is somebody runs away with it in the first couple of weeks, then some people who are at the bottom who aren't getting votes double down and they make their deck perfect and all of a sudden we see them shoot up. Sometimes people get into a negative zone where they can't get out of their own heads. But this practice of answering questions concisely, which you saw today, and presenting your idea concisely can only be done if you really understand your product, customer, and market. And what we find is the people who struggle with their presentations are the people who are actually struggling with their business. Not being able to present your company crisply could be you're just not a natural presenter and nobody's ever coached you. But it's more likely that you don't understand your actual business and you haven't made the tough decisions of how you are going to generate revenue, who your customers are, and how you're going to grow that business. So we pick companies that we think can focus in and we can coach on, you know, really good techniques for how to pitch a business in three minutes. But the truth is, if the business itself is flawed, there is no amount of shine you can put on it or technique to solve that problem. When answering questions, we ask people to listen deeply to what the investor is saying and to answer that question. 
in as few words as possible. In other words, be concise. And if you are a founder listening to this, I know there's a th over a thousand people listening to this right now, and most of them are founders, not investors. When asked a question, think deeply about why the investor, angel, venture, seed, or otherwise syndicate member is asking that question and answer it so that you get another one and another one. And then what you'll find is you're in a volley with the investor. They ask a question, you hit the ball back. They hit the question, you hit the ball back. Boom. And you're getting into that rhythm. And that means that you're going to be a great partner over the next decade. People who can't answer basic questions, they eliminate themselves from the funding or partnership opportunity because a lot of VCs will say, this person, maybe not coachable is the right word, but just hard and difficult to work with. I can't get information from them. I can't have a productive dialogue. So just a couple of tips there for people who are watching in what we do, what I do in my role here at the Accelerator is to work with Jackie and work with the founders on presenting their company and saying, why can't we present our revenue model well? Is it because you don't, you haven't figured out pricing? Or why can't we figure out how to present in one slide or two slides your growth strategy and your go-to-market strategy? Is it because you don't have one or because you haven't figured out a good one? Let's have that conversation, right? Um, so if you ever want to come to the Accelerator, it's very simple, launch.co slash apply. And um, I, uh, I spent a decent amount of time with these companies. It's really a great privilege uh, to see these founders work so hard through the pandemic. I think I filibustered enough. I see all the investors looking up. <laughs> Jackie, I'm going to leave it up to you to do sure. the three, two, and one. And then we will ask everybody who's watching on YouTube. YouTube doesn't have a polling piece of software, but if you're watching the YouTube live stream, I'd like you to give me your three, two, and one as well. Uh, one, two, and three. Boom. Just in, tell me which three In the three comment section? In the comments, the chat, mm -hmm. actually, on and, YouTube. And um, also, and, our syndicate members will be able to poll them after this. So we'll do this right. with the investor judges, and then we're going to do Zoom. So on, on Zoom, Zoom, there's a polling. We're, we're going to ask everybody on the Zoom um, who their number one company was. But wait for that. We'll go through the investors right now. Great. All right, I'm going to go backwards. Robert, are you ready to give us your three, two, one? Um, and we'll do it like this. So your three and your two, and just tell us the name and not why, and then your number one and why. Sure. Um, my three is Vaughn, uh, two is Support Pay, and one is Formulate. And I like Formulate because I think there's a lot of opportunity right now in in the intersection of personal wellness and data and customization. And so just a lot of interesting conference, a lot of interesting trends that I like and formulate. All right. Thanks, Robert. Ravi, are you ready with your three, two, and one? Yes, I am. My three is formulate. My two is fluent forever. And my number one is uh, soul savvy. Um, I chose soul savvy because the metrics speak for itself. The users are very engaged with 90% of them being daily active users and they're growing well. And it's a, big market. All right. Thank you. Pippa, your three and two and one, please. So I have a joint three, which is V1 and Fluent Forever. Two is Outlaw and one is Support Pay. And the reason for that is that, um, I mean, a couple of the others are more akin to what we usually invest in, which is apps and mobile. But I think that um, some of the, uh, I guess, the industry that Sherry laid out, if she can get um, some kind of regular recurring uh, users on this, it's a huge market. And I like the mission behind it. To pick just one for your third, which would it be? No ties. Fluent forever. Great. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> you set <laughs> up to four, so I thought that was allowed. Yes. But... Fourth is the <laughs> okay. honorable mention, for sure. Thank okay. you. No Thanks, Eva. Lolita. Uh, my number three is Soul Savvy, number two, Outlaw, and number one, Formulate. And uh, for a lot of the reasons Robert mentioned, I just see that there's so much potential in going different directions with the model that they're setting up. Okay, thank you. Jordan, your three, two, one, please. My three is uh, Fluent Forever. I love Gabe. I've been working with him for a bit. I like Outlaw so Soaps. I love the product, the traction, and the support pay. Uh, the mission is great. You're going to help people get along better, which is both financially, emotionally, and socially great. Thank you for doing that. And I'm divorced twice, so bingo. <laughs> okay, thank you. Jonathan, your three, two, one, please. Uh, three is soul savvy, two is fluent forever, and one is support pay. Um, I, I have concerns about uh, getting people to actually pay the subscription to support pay, uh, but 
Um, I think that it's a product that's well needed. And it's one of the few products we saw that really uh, doesn't have to fight against a lot of competition right now. All right, thanks. Presh, what are our scores so far before we take our last few? All right, so in first place, we've got Formulate with 4.5. Oh, sorry. First place, we've got Support Pay with 7 points. Second place, Formulate with 4.5. And third place is a tie uh, uh, with Soul Savvy Outlaw and Fluent Forever with 3 points. Okay, it's getting close. Um, Ellen, your 3, 2, 1, please. Uh, my three is support pay, two is so savvy, and one is uh, Outlaw. I think Outlaw has great traction, great founder market fit, and a super cool product. It's very unique. All right. Thank you, Ellen. Cindy, your three, two, one, please. Um, number three is Fluent for Forever. Uh, number two is V1. Uh, number one is Support Pay. Uh, so for Fluent for Forever, I really like the founder. You know, he, he wrote the book, best selling. But I'm a little bit concerned uh, if the market will be shrinking with AI translation. Um, how many more uh, users uh, would really come to the market? Uh, I really love the uh, Support Pay. That it's a real pain point. Uh, uh, it's a real pain they are solving. If they really do it well, they may even expand it to marriage. Uh, couples or couples who have children without getting married um, is this you know trend <laughs> of that going um but one uh, is a saturated market but i really like uh, uh, how the founder are presented so uh yeah so that's how i ordered them thanks cindy and all right ben you're last year three two one please great i'm last get to take a little more time this was a really hard one i, mean, I think this is one of the best batches i've seen i've seen quite a few um and I was told I could have an honorable mention. So I'm going to give the honorable mention to Soul Savvy in that I'm fascinated with this idea of these micro social networks and building them on top of Slack seems like a smart way to do it. So I'd love to watch how that progresses. My number three is Outlaw Soaps, mainly because I think it's a really cool product and would probably be more likely a personal investment or venture investment, but it's pretty cool. Formulate, number two, and number one, Fluent Forever. It does, the Fluent Forever market, I've been surprised by how large companies have been able to get in that space. I would not have expected that 10 years ago when I first started to see it. I do think the entrenched competition makes it hard. However, uh, taking a distinctly different way to get people to truly fluent is intriguing. Uh, the growth's been good. The expertise of the founder is exceptional. So that would got my number one slot. All right, thanks. Okay, Presh, what is our final tally? All right, in first place, we've got support pay with 9.5 points. In second play, we've got a three-company tie with 5.5 points for Fluent Forever, Formulate, and Outlaw Soaps. And in third place, we've got Soul Savvy with four points. Wow, uh, that's, a, that's a first. I'm pretty certain. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a first. This is a pretty strong class. Thanks to everybody coming. And now we'll do a quick vote. If you're on Zoom, we'll just ask any of the other LPs on Zoom to pick their number one company. Um, and... Uh, I just got that, and I am going to pick my number one company. I won't tell you who it is. Uh, a lot to vote. But, oh, host and panelists cannot vote. What? <laughs> oh, yes, bummer. it's your rules. <laughs> it's my rules. That's right. Uh, but everybody vote, and then uh, in a minute we'll do that. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I know everybody's very busy. Uh, we're not uh, in quarantine, and it's very uncertain times, but we think that the down market is where the fortunes are built. They're just collected in the up market. And we are seeing extraordinary companies and founders who are very cash efficient, who turn nickels into dollar bills or quarters into $5 bills. Uh, they're capital efficient and they're focused on revenue and customers. And that's our wheelhouse, bootstrappers, builders, uh, people who can take a small amount of money and, and take it uh, a long way in terms of growing their revenue. We're looking for companies to invest in that have products in market, but don't have a series A yet. So it's very important as investors to know your Goldilocks zone, where you can do your most, uh, good, you do your best work basically and get your, the most returns for us. That's a company that's launched a product and has, you know, in the case of FitBot or com.com, um, or a number of companies have done well, Lead IQ with us, they had under $10,000 a month in revenue. And then we start working with those companies and get them to 30, 40, 50 K in revenue. And that's when the seed funds really start to engage. And then when they hit that million to $3 million, that's when the VC funds do the series A's. And that's just broad simplification of numbers. Obviously there's a lot of 
margin differences between marketplaces, SaaS companies, consumer companies, et cetera. But that's just generally uh, where we live. And uh, in the voting, the poll results are showing, it looks like support pay and formulate with 29% each, an exact tie with 40 votes. Wow, something is happening. Fluent Forever in, in second place after the two-way tie in first with uh, 31 votes, 23%. Jason, who would you vote for time. then since you can't, but you can't tell us? Go ahead, tell well, us. Well, you know, I, I, I can give you uh, some ideas. You know, some of these businesses are very easy to make an investment in because they're predictable subscription businesses. So I feel like it doesn't take a lot of courage to invest in Fluent Forever, Soul Savvy, Support Pay, um, uh, and, and companies uh, like that um, because they have subscriptions. Now, you look at a company like Freedrum, they're making that pivot from hardware into subscription. That's a little more challenging. You have to, make, you have to believe that will work. So I believe that will work. And then you look at Formulate. Well, that's kind of a unique product, isn't it? Um, mass customized, and then you look at V1, again, uh, no code, and they're doing something new. So th there are easy bets to make, and then there are, as an investor, I believe, and then there are the wild cards. My track record is a taxi company, a meditation app, and a stock trading app for millennials. So if you look at those three, all three of those, I think, were pretty big long shots. Uh, so I love the long shots, and in this group, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say who the long shot is. Some people might say Soul Savvy is the long shot here um, because it's such a unique, interesting, different idea. Um, so I'm going to go with today, Soul Savvy, uh, but that's based on a personal interest I have and a hope that I think communities can be monetized with subscriptions. That doesn't mean I think it's the one that's going to return the most money from, from us. Exactly, quite the opposite. I think it's the most risk-taking of the group. So I like the risk-taking ones because if they do work, right, I never ask myself, like, what's the chances it's going to work? I ask myself how big it could get. I, I could see Dejan and the team and Soul Savvy having these paid communities across 10 different verticals eventually and, and really creating something that doesn't exist in the world right now. And I like things that don't exist in the world right now in terms of, you know, the, the total addressable market for meditation apps was zero when I invested in Calm, right? Um, and, and so that's kind of an interesting thing to me is when the total addressable market is zero. You know, we could tell you soap and shampoo and, you know, SaaS products. We, we know the total addressable market for many of these companies. Perhaps they expand it, but it's a good question. Um, so I promised I'd get you out of here in an hour, and we did that. Uh, we did a little extra banter, so we got to 75 minutes. Um, but I really do appreciate uh, all the support that the investment community gives uh, the companies uh, at launch, especially in terms of time. Uh, the, great, the best thing you can do as an investor is to have that you know, open heart, open ears, and, and spend time with these founders. And you don't want to waste their time, but also you know, if you've got some scar tissue and some knowledge, spending some time as an investor, even a 10K investor, a 25K investor may seem like a small check. But I've heard repeatedly from founders that the smaller the check size, uh, paradoxically, the, the greater the effort on the angel investor. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And, and that does track, you know, sometimes people who get, you know, uh, write the big checks, uh, you know, maybe they don't have as much time on their hands, but the, the early stage angels and the syndicate members really do spend uh, some time, try the products. Don't ask for free product. It's another uh, one that, that I always uh, tell people, just go pay for the product and use it and it's great. So I really appreciate y'all coming. Stay safe. We're, we're starting the LA 19 class. Uh, in fact, this afternoon, Jackie, am I right, is week one for LA 19? Yes. And then uh, we have four of the seven for LA 20 already selected and signed and wired, I believe, a couple in diligence. So we're just um, doing this Groundhog Day thing where we're just gonna keep investing. Um, and I really appreciate everybody coming. If you're a founder, you know how to get us, uh, launch.co slash apply. We're also doing something called remotedemoday.com, which is for any company that wants to pitch the 4,000 members of the syndicate and anybody else who is an accredited investor who wants to come. And that's happening on Tuesday, Jackie, remotedemoday.com. Is that right? Yes. 
So we're going to do seven companies. I think one of them is uh, of the six is one we've invested in already. The other six are just new companies and I meet those as well. So if you like this format, we're doing it for other companies as well that are raising. Perhaps you have a company that's raising and you can just go to remotedemoday.com and have them fill out the form and then the team will look at it. And we share that deal flow with everybody. So that's like an open platform we're testing. Thanks for coming, everybody. And we'll see you next time at launch. Accelerator. Thanks, everyone. And congrats to all the founders. Demo day. Congrats, founders. We'll have a barbecue at some point at my house. Sorry, we can't have barbecue. When we, we, get, when we get to meet you for the first time in person. Yeah, we'll meet some of you in person. <laughs> That'd be really cool to meet you all. Uh, you can invest over Zoom. It's okay, everybody.